Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the strange first slide, but you will understand in one second why uh, I did it that way. So first, I'm realizing that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. And so I promise not to be too long. Uh, second, I noticed in the program that it says that the organizers plans the seminar talks to be mostly educational. And so I decided to try to do a talk following these guidelines. Uh, I hope it was not just said to get funding. No, sorry. Uh, and uh, so I, I might bore some of the experts in the audience, but I hope that they will also find something. So first, I, I would like, before I start, to thank the organizers for having me. It's a tremendous pleasure to be at this uh, conference in honor of Boris, uh, Boris' birthday, but also the physics that Boris has, has spanned around him uh, uh, in, in, in these 36 years about of, uh, of physics. And I must say this is both a fantastic conference, the program is extraordinary, but the atmosphere is, is also extraordinary. And, and this reflects the personality of Boris. Uh, there are many things I like in Boris. One of things which appeals to my Mediterranean heart is the fact that he speaks with his hands. And I have proof, because I try to capture him uh, at the school in Trieste, and you cannot you know, get a clean picture of the hands. Uh, Boris has this talent to explain in simple terms the things he can do with a tremendously high skill. The second thing that I like uh, about Boris, uh, and maybe this also reflects on my uh, spherical parameter, is the fact that he enjoys uh, good things in life, and I think this was already said by Leonid. And this is not something that is recent. Here are more ancient photographs where you see Boris deep in discussion with a gentleman whose face is for the moment hidden, but I'm sure uh, most of you have recognized him. Is the responsible for the very nice drawing uh, that uh, we have on the image. It's Alexei Zvelik, another proud member of the 60 plus club, who actually celebrated also in Trieste last year. And you can see that not only he enjoys good friend and good conversation, but he goes for the really important things in life, the cheese. And good food, good wine, these are uh, all centers. So this is uh, really a pleasure to be here and uh, discuss uh, the physics of disordered systems in which, of course, uh, Boris is a, is a pivotal uh, figure. So I will discuss mostly the 1D quantum systems because these are uh, the ones uh, I know uh, best. So my talk goes in continuation of the one you heard by uh, Jora this morning. Uh, and I will uh, present various uh, experimental realizations uh, of this system and also some of the theory. There are many theories that contributed in some uh, uh, part uh, of, the, of, of my own understanding of disordered system. Of course, most and foremost was Ein Schulz, my uh, uh, former PhD advisor, who unfortunately uh, passed away. But there are all these uh, more recent collaborators. And of course, we had uh, the chance to have fantastic collaborations with experimental group. And I will show their names and picture uh, uh, a little bit later in the, in the talk. So in this audience, I don't think I need to spend much time to remind what Anderson localization is. Is the fact that when you get waves in a random potential, well, they get localized. So everything decreases exponentially. And it works for anything, light, sounds, electrons, and so on. And it has now even its own website. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than 50 years ago that this has been uh, proven to be a fantastically uh, powerful theory. And of course, things get complicated when you start putting interaction. Now, normally we sweep the interaction under the rug for fermion because we use Landau Fermi liquid theory to say that the only effect of the interaction is kind of renormalize the mass of the particle, and then we are back to square one. And of course, this is not the whole story. 
and the story is much more complicated. And there are uh, many semi-loan contributions that show that this is much more complicated. And of course, it starts with Altschuler Aronoff, uh, where they showed that the interplay of disorder and interactions, the disorder gets modified by the interaction, the interaction gets modified by the disorder. And so the Fermi liquid uh, uh, ID is only carrying you so far. I will not discuss the case of fermions, but I will concentrate uh, on which there are many questions, but I will concentrate on the case of bosons because this is where the competition is the fiercest. Uh, normal bosons, if I can say, if you put them somewhere, they usually turn to be superfluid, so they should resist to disorder. Uh, Non-interacting particles should be localized, so how is the fight between the two? And you immediately realize when you do this, I will not uh, spend too much time on the argument that the case of free bosons is totally pathological. If you take free bosons, they just fall into the deepest well of the potential, and there is always one well which makes them happy. But if one boson goes there, then 10 to the 23 bosons goes there. So you get a state where you get a macroscopic number of bosons in a finite region of space. So as soon as you put interaction, it's a bomb. It explodes and throw bosons all over the place so that you recover density. So for bosons, you should include interaction from the start if you want to, to have a non-pathological uh, thermodynamic limit. And of course, this is complicated. Uh, you heard this morning in Jora's talk about finite temperature properties. Here, I'm going back to ground state, sort of thermodynamic property, assuming that the system has reached some uh, thermal equilibrium. And this is a problem that was attacked and solved now some time ago. And the consequence of the competition between interaction and disorder is the fact that there is a localized phase of bosons that arise. So non-interacting bosons are always localized pathologically, as I was saying. But if you put interaction, you find that the superfluid exists in a re-entrant region here, so surrounded by some uh, localized phase, which has been nicknamed the Bose glass. So you get a very strange effect of interactions, which if you put interactions, you start by delocalizing the bosons. You make them more superfluid. But if you push too strongly on the interaction level, then on the contrary, you make them more localized, and you get this re-entrant superfluid phase. So this was uh, fun <laughs> predictions. And of course, it has started a certain number of uh, theoretical and experimental activity to try to uh, probe it. So if I want to make a very fast summary of what are the various phases that you can have for bosons on a lattice, if you're not on a lattice, you forget the first one. The, the first one is the so-called MOT insulator, where you get one boson per site, and they repel. So if you try to add one boson, you get incompressible, uh, uh, an incompressible fluid. You cannot... Uh, add one boson without paying an energy cost. And of course, it's an insulator. Uh, sorry for this, it's strange. It should be the modulus uh, of the function anyway. So the, the, there is no superfluid order. This should be the average of the other parameter. Uh, now, uh, the second possible phase is a superfluid, which I don't know how to draw. Uh, but this is a superfluid. So a superfluid is compressible. You can add particle at, uh, uh, let's say, zero energy cost in the thermodynamic limit. And you, you get this time a non-zero average value of the single particle operator if you're above one dimension. If you're in one dimension, then this decays as a power law. You get quasi long range order. And finally, you get the Bose glass where, again, I don't know how to draw the interacting uh, system, but which sort of is a mixture between the two possibilities. It's compressible. You can find place to add particles, but on the other end, the order parameter is still zero or the correlation function decays exponentially. In order to make the connection with what Jora was telling this morning and what is known as many-body localization after the works of uh, Denis Basco, Igor Aleiner, and uh, uh, Boris, is the fact that here I'm discussing equilibrium. And I will mostly discuss T equals zero and will not worry about what happens at finite temperature, at least for the moment. Okay? 
So uh, how to find or how to identify this phase is, of course, a certain uh, present already a certain challenge. There are many uh, 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 numerical work that were uh, done. I just show one uh, by using DMRG, showing the reentrance of the superfluid phase, and also showing how the MOT insulator phase sort of pollutes the phase diagram. This is for Hubbard model of bosons on a 1D lattice, but you see clearly that there is the superfluid surrounded by this uh, localized post glass phase. Now, as a theorist, there are, you could say, fine, this is something which is now very old. What are the open theoretical questions that we have? I will try to go a little bit fast on the theoretical questions because I would rather discuss the recent experimental findings. But there, is, there has been very recently a debate on whether there is a universal exponent at the transition. One of the predictions that was made in the original uh, studies was that exactly at this point on this line, sorry, not at this point, but on this line, the exponent controlling the decay of the correlation function should be a universal number. And uh, this stemmed from a control renormalization group calculation, so it sounded as a robust uh, question. But there were more recent works by Ehud Altman, Gil Raphael, and collaborators which did a, 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 a study that I will discuss in a second and which found a different result. If you want to have a, a, a nice account of various uh, current questions on a disordered system, I recommend this uh, volume of the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences, the so-called CRAS, which is not sounding nice even in, 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 in English, uh, but which is a nice compilation of various articles on disorder, including an, an article by uh, Eud Altman uh, on uh, the subject. Okay, so uh, the idea is the following. When you solve this problem, you use a technique which is known as bosonization, uh, which is very convenient because it allows you to get rid of the interaction. But this technique is not guaranteed, let's say, above a certain line here in the interaction disorder phase diagram. So now the question is what happens here. Let's say what happens in the strong disorder, weak interaction limit, and this is exactly where Eud and collaborators studied the problem uh, using a real space renormalization group technique. And in this region, they found non-universal exponents at the transition. So the question is how to reconcile the two results. Uh, I think this is still something which is uh, ongoing. There has been several works by um, Ehud and collaborator by Prokofiev, Svistunov, and Lodepole in particular. Uh, we did some work uh, with uh, uh, Zoran Ristivojevic and Alexandra Petkovic on the subject for first to guarantee that the exponents here are indeed universal, that it was not an artifact of the uh, uh, RG group that we were using. And so the, the question is, is there. Uh, there seemed to be a critical point somewhere along this dome, which separate two regimes. So then there are obviously uh, questions that need to be addressed. What are the consequences for the both glass phases uh, or both glass phase, which is surrounding the, whole, the dome, and so on and so forth. OK, so there are many other questions that remain. To play with this uh, uh, question, we analyzed recently a model, a little model that I like, which is a model made of ladders uh, but where essentially each rung of the ladder is considered as a single site. Uh, in a way, it allows to introduce more particles per site than a normal uh, 1D systems, because you see that now, uh, in a way, you can put zero, one boson here, but you can also put zero, one boson here. So at the end, you have now the possibility to make more density fluctuations that you would do in a simple model. Of course, it's not like having a single chain of bosons with more density fluctuations, because these two chains are distinguishable by their chain index, so the uh, operators are not really bosonic operator between the two chains. But nevertheless, it's an interesting model. Okay, the second question that one can ask is what about other forms of disorder? You heard in the talk of uh, Jora this morning about biperiodic lattices, and one of the interesting questions is whether these biperiodic lattices where you put two cosine, for example, which are incommensurate between themselves can be viewed 
as similar to a random potential. Let's say this one creates a lattice, and the other one is like a random potential in the lattice created by the first, or whether they have very different properties. So for non-interacting system, this is something very well understood. This is called the Aubry-André model, and Jora discussed it. And it has a localization transition. The difference between disorder and this type of system is that you need a threshold of, di of disorder uh, to get uh, uh, the transition. But except for that, it's very similar. And one can wonder uh, whether in the presence of interaction, one has properties which are similar as true disorder. Uh, actually, it's a problem that one can study by the same or an extension of the renormalization group that was used by true disorder. It has very interesting uh, consequence, something we did with Dominique Moana and uh, Julien Vidal, uh, not Julien Vidal, sorry, not Geoffrey Vidal. It has nothing to do with uh, the Vidal of quantum information. And the answer is one finds a phase diagram and properties which are very similar to the one of true disorder. For, so let me say it that way, for all practical purposes, biperiodic systems are very, very similar to truly disordered systems. There are differences, as I said. The transition does not occur for infinitesimal disorder as it would for true disorder. But except for that, you get the superfluid phase, and you get the Mott insulator phase, and you get a Bose glass phase where uh, all wave functions are localized exponentially. Okay, and finally, the last question, but on which I will not have to say anything, is I just use these acronyms to uh, try to uh, distinguish uh, in the mind of people the two uh, concepts, but of course the in interesting question is to connect them, is what is the connection, if any, between the localization of what I would call interacting particle, which means I study a problem in equilibrium uh, where the system has relaxed in presence of a thermostat, and the many-body localization problem, where at least in the form it has evolved uh, after the original works, was to say, let me study a problem at finite energy and see if there is a localization in Fox space uh, of this problem. Okay. Now, let me go back to experiment and try uh, a, a little bit to uh, discuss what has been done to try to hunt for this Bose glass phase and this disordered uh, uh, bosonic uh, phase. So, of course, there was a first generation of experiments, but if you think about it, it's not so easy to find bosons in condensed matter context. The only bosons you have are essentially helium-4 or Cooper pairs. And besides that, actually it's not true, I will show you bosons in condensed matter context a little bit later, but essentially, people tried Josephson junction arrays they, of course, uh, were fantastic experiments in disordered superconducting films uh, in um, uh, various groups, and I'm sure uh, Aaron Kapitulnik uh, uh, will uh, probably talk much more about this. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, helium in porous media was also used, but none of this realization was very... Uh, 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 I, I, each one had its own drawback. Okay, maybe this was definitely the most uh, advanced, but certainly for one-dimensional system, one was extremely poor in uh, 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 realizations. Fortunately, the situation has changed radically because now we have absolutely, in the last, let's say, 15 years or so, we have absolutely new remarkable systems. The first and foremost is provided by cold atoms. In cold atoms, it's very easy using counter-propagating lasers to put a lattice and then realize 1D tubes in which you can put, as Jora explained, disorder by either a speck hole or by putting a second lattice which is making a bichromatic uh, potential. Uh, there are new superconductors that appear which are kind of atomically flat because they are realized at the interface between two oxides. And one can imagine patterning these uh, 2D superconductors uh, either by gating or by other techniques. There were writing techniques, for example, in the group of Jeremy Levy in Pittsburgh to realize one-dimensional structures on which one can study this uh, transition. And I would like to spend a, a part, sizable part of the talk to discuss something which seems to have nothing to do with bosons, but actually is a fantastic realization of potentially disordered bosons, which is provided by spins 
and dimers, okay? So I will uh, perhaps concentrate mostly on this one, but let me first comment uh, and discuss some recent experiment that was done in uh, cold atomic systems. So the advantage of cold atoms is of course that you have potentially control of the interactions as you want and control on the disorder. And I'll show you a recent experiment that was done by the Florence group, uh, Jora again, uh, mentioned it in his talk, um, using quasi-periodic uh, systems, so using this double uh, uh, periodicity. So this was the experiment done in the group of Giovanni Modugno and uh, Massimo Inguscio, and you have the other culprit which are written here. And on the theory side, uh, we, we helped a little bit with the experiment, and the lion's share of the work was done by Guillaume Roux at the LPTMS uh, in uh, uh, Orsay. So what is the idea? You, you realize tubes of, of uh, bosons, of potassium uh, atom bosons. You put them in this incommensurate uh, potential. And you have a, a fantastic trick that I don't want to discuss, which is called a fetch bar resonance, which allows you, by turning a button, to vary the strength of the interaction at will. And now the problem is that you have to decide whether you get superfluid particles or superfluid tubes, or you get Bose glass, or you get something else. And that's where things become a little bit more difficult. So what was done? What was done was to measure the momentum distribution, it's done by technical time of flight, and compare with what we can compute using the Luttinger liquid theory, the theory of 1D interacting particle in their low energy sector, and also DMRG calculations, which at the time were done at zero temperature. Now there are some new uh, calculations done by Guillaume Roux and Thomas Bartel at finite temperature, but at the time this was done at zero temperature. And so we had to put the temperature, and we know analytically very well how to put back the temperature. And in 1D, you sort of have an exponential decay with a thermal length, and so we could introduce the temperature in this way. So the blue line would be the zero temperature uh, result of the corresponding parameters, one knows very well the parameters, of course, in a cold atom experiment. And the uh, uh, red line is the same system with the exponential decay coming from the thermal length. And the dark line is the experimental system. So you see that there is good agreement. Uh, and we can extract from the experiment the thermal length that we need to fit the profiles. So here is the phase diagram. This is disorder. This is interaction, repulsion. The bluer you have the, 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 the color, the more narrow is the end of case. So you can expect that the superfluid region is somewhere there. And this region, you don't know if it's conducting or insulating, but you know that it's certainly not very superfluid. The, the N of K is extremely broad. And so at least it seems reminiscent of the phase diagram that you uh, saw before. Actually, one can make fits of the profile. I don't want to discuss them in the, in the various region. And they can be fitted indeed with a single thermal length, except in the mod phase, I don't want to discuss this, uh, uh, which at least gives credence to the analysis. This would be the phase diagram, the theoretical phase diagram at t equals zero. This is the experimental uh, phase diagram. So it signals the loss of coherence and of course, there are complications. There are complications that make uh, analysis, theoretical analysis, a little bit more uh, subtle. Uh, the first one is that these bosons are in a trap. They are in a bowl, a chemical potential which grows as R squared from the origin of the trap. So as a result, the density of bosons is not homogeneous. And you see very clearly that there are plateaus where the density of bosons is commensurate, so there they are in the mod phase, and there are regions, this is without disorder, and there are regions where the density of bosons is incommensurate. So of course, making an analysis and comparing with uh, at least predictions which were intended for an homogeneous system is difficult. Of course, in the numerics, we can put the trap and take it into account, uh, but it makes the bare analysis of the data a little bit more uh, subtle. Okay, how do you know if it's an insulator or if it's a, let's say, superfluid? Well, you prepare in equilibrium, you move the trap, you wait a little bit, and then you release the bosons and you measure by how much 
or, or you measure the momentum of the bosons after the expansion. And what you see very clearly, here are cuts which are done through the phase diagram. You see very clearly that above a certain interaction, then the thing drops completely, which means that this is moving, this is not moving. This at least moves much less. Here, if you go to the red slice, you see that it's not moving very much, then it starts moving, and then it stops moving uh, a, a, a little bit, uh, again, at large repulsion. And again, so it gives credence to the fact that this is indeed at least a mobile phase. Superfluid is too strong, but the coherence uh, peak goes well with the superfluid, and that this phase here is an insulating phase. But there is one last piece which is missing, is that here one is polluted by the existence of the mod phase, the commensurate mod phase. So we would like to know at least if around here we get some evidence of the Bose glass. And without going too much into details, one way one can do this is by an experiment which is very close to optical conductivity in condensed matter. What you do, you shake the lattice in which the particles are in, and when you do that, it's very similar to making a frequency-dependent conductivity of the system. You measure the energy that is deposited. You measure the energy which is absorbed by the system. And therefore, you do spectroscopy of the system at the frequency omega of the modulation. I don't want to uh, go into detail of the, of the uh, uh, procedure, but what is measured is not the current-current correlation function, but it's the kinetic energy, kinetic energy correlation function. It's close enough. Uh, one can do a shaking of the lattice in the uh, horizontal direction, and then it would really be the current-current correlation function. So you can do spectroscopy that way. So this is what they did. They prepared in equilibrium. They started shaking the lattice for a while, and then they released and did energy measurement. If you are here in the mod phase, no disorder, very large interaction, you find two peaks. One is at U, the value of the repulsion. The other is at 2U, and we understand these peaks very well. This is exactly what you expect in a MOT insulator. If you do it a little bit above in the disorder, you find that a third peak appears, and this peak can be analyzed theoretically and is well in agreement with what we would expect if there was, a, let's say, a Bose glass phase in that uh, particular uh, region. If you remember the conductivity of even free fermions in one dimension, it goes to zero at omega, goes to zero. It has a peak at a certain frequency, which is the Fermi velocity divided by the localization length, and then it drops as a power of the frequency at high frequency. And this peak is similar to the peak that one would get in the uh, optical conductivity for uh, localized uh, particles. So all in all, this experiment is very consistent with what are the theoretical predictions. It shows very clearly this reentrance of a phase which is coherent and which is mobile, so I would like to call it the superfluid, and it shows it's surrounded by phases which are uh, both uh, insulating uh, and incoherent from the point of view of superconductivity. The phase here is clearly uh, polluted at least severely by the MOT uh, phase, and this phase is certainly, or most likely, uh, the Bose glass. But of course, there are many directions in which one should improve to get something which uh, is really a smoking gun, smoking gun for the Bose glass phase, and it's the temperature. If possible, get rid of the MOT insulator by removing the lattice, which means now putting a true disorder, putting a speckle, and even better, uh, get rid of the trap to make more easily direct comparison between experiment and the theory. Okay, let me now move to another system which apparently is completely different and even one doesn't see why it should be there. And you will see that it's really complementary of the one that is coming from the coal atom. So why am I discussing spins when I'm discussing bosons? And actually, it's relatively simple, and it's something we, we, we had in a, in a now old paper together with Alexei Tzvelik. Uh, let's look at, for example, uh, ladders, which are made of dimers, which are made of strong rungs like this, 
And for the moment, let me ignore the weaker exchange coupling here between the dimers. Now it's a trivial problem. Each rung has a singlet and three degenerate triplet state. And it becomes interesting if I start now putting a magnetic field because the singlet will not disperse and one of the triplets will go down. So if I manage to get it cross the singlet, I will get a quantum phase transition between a state which is non-magnetized and a state which has magnetization one at each rank. Now, uh, of course, uh, so I will start getting triplets everywhere. Now, I don't, I don't remember who said everything which has two states can be mapped onto a spin one half or can be mapped onto a qubit. And this is the case here. You can make a representation where you say the singlet I map onto an absence of bosons on the rung and the triplet I map onto one boson on the rung. Now, of course, you need to limit the number of bosons on the rung for this mapping to be valid. And essentially, you get hardcore bosons so that you cannot put more than one boson on the rank. The mapping is faithful. It respects all the commutation relations. So this type of system can be directly be mapped on a system of bosons. Now, because of the other exchange, if they are present, the triplet can hop on other ranks. And therefore, the dispersion of the triplet here is, is, exists is of the order of the smaller exchange, which means that you don't get one quantum phase transition, but we, you get two. You get one first when the first triplet, usually Q equals zero, is entering in the system. Then you start filling a band of triplets, or triplons if you prefer, and then at the second field, you have put one triplet per rung, so that's it. So what you have here is a system which can effectively be mapped onto a system of itinerant bosons which live on the rungs and the kinetic energy of the bosons is fixed by the exchange. This is the extension for dimers of the very well-known Matsubara-Matsuda mapping for spin one half. That down spin is zero bosons, spin up is one bosons, and the S plus, S minus operator is B dagger B. The JZ term, SZ, SZ, is the product of the two densities of bosons. And that's it. Now, the thing which is interesting is that the magnetic field is a chemical potential for the bosons. And compared to people who desperately try to uh, use gates to dope by a mere 10% in two dimensions only, itinerant objects, fermions usually, here you can, do you can use your magnetic field as a chemical potential in 3D, there is absolutely no problem. And you can go from zero boson per site to one boson per site, so from an empty band to a field band. Moreover, you have an excellent control on the density of bosons because for spins, probes have been developed for the last, whatever, 60 years, 70 years. Magnetization is just the number of bosons. The neutron and NMR, they give you access to dynamical correlation. SZSZ is nothing but the density-density correlation of bosons. And S plus, S minus, which can, for example, be measured in neutron scattering experiment, is nothing but the single particle correlation for bosons. So we have a quantum simulator, which means a system experimentally, which is a faithful realization of a very simple model of itinerant boson on the lattice. And we can use this model with an excellent degree, I mean, the experimental system with an excellent degree of uh, control. So these systems are complementary to cold atoms. Cold atoms, you have essentially a perfect control of lattice and parameters, interaction, disorder. You have perfect short range interactions, but you have to pay the price of the inhomogeneities in inherent to the trap. Of course, they are working very hard on that to improve this. And sometimes you don't have the probe that you would need to get the phenomenon you want to investigate. The BC, the, the, the dimers, if you want, uh, they are very homogeneous. These are remarkably homogeneous system. You have a perfect density control via the magnetic field of the bosons in the system. You have exactly the set of probes that you need to get density, density, uh, uh, single particle, and so on correlations. But of course, you have to take what your chemist friend, if you have a chemist friend, is giving you in terms of sample. If you're not happy with the exchange, the kinetic energy, the interaction, too bad. Change chemistry, get another one. 
uh, because there is nothing you can do. You can apply a little bit of pressure or do things like this, but it won't go very far. Now, if you want to know more about this class of material, how one can see Bose-Einstein condensation, for example, in them, there is a, a little review that we wrote with uh, Christian Rueg, Oleg Chernichov, uh, a couple of years ago. Now, just to show you that I'm not just dreaming as a theorist, here is a compound which exists. Here is the structure of the compound. It's made of uh, intercalated ladders here. The sides here are spin one half side. They carry spin one half. They are copper side. And they are separated by these very complicated bonds here, which allow to reduce the exchange enough so that they can be manipulated by a human magnetic field. Because most antiferromagnets, they have exchange of 600, 700 Kelvin. Then you need 700 Tesla to fill the band. So it's totally useless. Here you get 12 Kelvin along this rung, and you would get about 4 Kelvin here along the legs. And the coupling between the ladders is about 50 millikelvin. So these are excellent compounds from the point of view of studying one-dimensional structure. Actually, we analyze quantitatively tomonaga lottinger liquid properties in this uh, compound. I refer you to this publication for this. And we obtain remarkable agreement with the calculation that one can do from uh, bosonization and tomonaga lottinger liquid. But here, what I want to mention is, of course, that now you can play with these systems by disordering the bonds here. They have, for example, chlorine or bromine. Now, if you substitute the bromine by another atom, let's say chlorine, what you get is you change this exchange here without touching the copper sites themselves. So it's not the standard zinc or nickel substitution where you replace, uh, where you replace a spin one half by a spin zero or a spin one, but you can essentially exchange the bonds, uh, sorry, you can essentially modify the bonds in a random way in order to get something which is akin to the uh, dirty bosons, the disordered bosons that uh, we would like to have. So there are already several studies that have been made in that uh, respect. Uh, I don't want to discuss all the compounds. There are variations on what I'm presenting you. Uh, this one is from Zeludev Group in, uh, uh, OK, then uh, PSI, now ETH. And you see very clearly, for example, the type of quantity one can measure. Here is the magnetization with respect to magnetic field. The pristine sample, the non-disordered sample, has something which looks like this. So this is where uh, boson starts to enter the system. Now, if you disorder the system, you see that a boson starts to enter before, which is not abnormal. And then you get a region where the material is perfectly compressible. This is the derivative, DMDH, the compressibility. Now, here is the peak intensity that was measured by neutrons. And in this region, you see that although you get bosons in the system, they don't see peak intensity, which means the average of the single particle object is zero. So it means this is not a superfluid, if I use the bosonic language. Whether it's the Bose glass, well, it would be too nice, but this experiment has a certain number of imperfections, uh, and uh, uh, one needs to, to, to solve them. But essentially, it shows you that one can study this type of problems uh, using these materials. Here is another uh, experiment done in Japan. This is the temperature magnetic field phase diagram. This is the pristine system, which shows the two-third exponent characteristics of the Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, and these are disordered system. We showed uh, a marked range, a marked change in the phase boundary with different exponents, which can then be analyzed in terms of, again, Bose glass uh, uh, transition. A more recent paper using another, yet another compound where again exponents of the phase diagrams uh, were uh, analyzed. Let me just show you uh, uh, to finish uh, uh, a view on uh, uh, some recent uh, work which is done in the group of Christian Rueg uh, in PSI uh, together with his uh, student um, uh, Ward. Uh, which consists in disordering the compound that I just showed you. Go from bromine to chlorine. Uh, so this is something that Simon uh, did. And you see already that the color of the material is quite different if you go from totally bromine compound to totally chlorine compound. 
the phase diagrams in terms of the magnetic field temperature is quite different. The values of the exchange that you get for uh, this material is not at all the same than what you get for this material. But except for that, you see it's essentially the same physics. You get no bosons here. You start putting bosons in the material. And for most of the temperatures, they are in Tomonaga letting a liquid state. If you go too low, they, they finish by having a 3D phase transition. This is of the order of uh, 100 millikelvin. Uh, and this is of the order of 4 or 5 Kelvin. So you have a wide range to study tomonaga Luttinger liquid properties. And by making mixtures of this, few percent, you can go to disordered uh, bosons. So let me uh, flash some very recent results that we are uh, obtaining. Of course, characterizing the disorder in this system is not so easy because the uh, chlorine can substitute in many places in the system. So we are analyzing this with Shunzuke Furia, who is a postdoc in my group, Corinna, who is at Bonn University, and Simon Ward and Christian Rueg are, of course, doing the uh, experiment and are the driving force uh, in this analysis. If you do first the analysis in the gap phase, so somewhere where you don't get bosons, let's say somewhere there, then only the spin flip that the neutron is doing is creating a triplet excitation. So what you have done is you have put one particle in the problem. So this is very simple because what you're doing, you're studying standard Anderson localization. One particle in a random potential. And for the bosons, it would mean studying the single particle correlation. So it's the if you want the, the density of state of the problem resolved in K. Here is the dispersion that you get. This is not experiment. This is theory. Uh, this is the dispersion that you would get if you are exciting with the neutrons a single triplet. Then this guy moves on the lattice. So it has a very natural tight binding uh, dispersion relation. Again, the intensity shows this is where you see neutron absorption. If you start disordering the material, of course, you will start having uh, a, a, a density of state that is affected by the disorder. And you can see here already uh, things appear. You see states which are non-dispersing in energy, but which are broad in K, which are good indication of localized state. And when one compares the theoretical predictions uh, with the neutron scattering experiments, it gives reasonable agreement. So we are starting to get confident that we can characterize the disorder in this material uh, reliably. And then, of course, the next step is to go in the tomonaga lettinger liquid regime, or at least we, where we would expect to have a finite number of bosons and see whether we can identify a Bose glass phase in this uh, regime uh, or not. OK, I will stop here. My conclusion, well, disorder and interaction is alive and kicking. There are many problems, and there has been a complete renewal of experimental systems uh, that uh, allows us to go much further in the analysis of this system. I'm certainly looking forward to discussion and interaction with Boris for the next 60 years on this subject. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to it. And of course, I conclude by wishing you a happy birthday, Boris. Thank you for your attention.